Okay, let's start. So we'll talk about data modeling now. Uh, data modeling in modern applications. So I will explain what I call modern application. It's more the way we build application today compared to before. And before is when relational data modeling was um, invented and, and, and used a lot. The idea is that the all the normalization, the relational theory SQL that we have learned, at least that I have learned long time ago, uh, doesn't fit application today. Because today people do not spend long time on design before starting to code an application. Today you have to go faster. And the idea behind that is to still recommend to do some design, but in a way that can be fast, not annoying developers with all the normal forms and all the theory about it, because if we do that, they will just run and go to no SQL, for example. So that's the modern application. What people do today with short releases, with small services, microservices, uh, rather than building something too complex. I'm Frank Pachot, I'm developer advocate at Yugabyte. Yugabyte is a, um, an open source distributed SQL database which uses Postgres for the query layer. So everything that we do on it looks like Postgres because you are connected to a Postgres back backend. The difference is in the storage. And I will do some comparisons also to show you how it is important when you do data modeling to understand how it works physically behind, which was not the case also in the origin of uh, data modeling, where people started with a logical data model and, and, and were thinking just after about the implementation. Today, we need to think immediately about the implementation. Uh, so first, I will introduce normalization. Uh, in SQL, in relational databases, we are always saying that the model sh must be normalized. So when I've learned databases, I've learned a lot about normalization and normal forms. I don't know if all of you heard about the third normal form, the, 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 the first, the second, the third normal form, and all the forms that are uh, later. That's a lot of theory. It's very interesting. It's like math. It's very interesting, but maybe too much theory to start quickly on something. So when I was at the university, I learned a lot about normal forms. And then when I started to work, so that's uh, 20 years uh, ago, I learned a lot about denormalization. And, and, and then there is a problem. You learn something at school, and then you realize that what people do is exactly doing the opposite because of performance, because of whatever. So should we learn, read about normal forms? Yes, if you are interested about it, uh, but maybe it's too much theory for, for modern design. But I will talk a bit ab about it. I have pointers problem, but not a big problem with the keyboard. It works. Uh, so yeah, that was just an illustration on Stack Overflow, the many questions. Uh, uh, you should denormalize. How uh, should you denormalize? So first, I will try to define normalization. And I will start it with only the wrong answers. And you may recognize the, the logos. I take the wrong answers from NoSQL databases. MongoDB says in, in their page where they explain SQL, they say that uh, normalization is there to avoid duplication. OK, that's right. Because of the cost of storage. The idea is that in the 80s, 90s, the, the disks were expensive. And then we had to normalize to store less data. I put that in the wrong answer. Uh, I will explain. But they clearly said that. Just uh, at the same time, another NoSQL database, DynamoDB, uses the same words 
optimize the uh, of the storage uh, was the reason for normalization before, and we don't need it today because disk is cheap. Or I put references. Oh, sorry, I put references to to a uh, presentation. No, that's me. I, I'm not clicking on the right button, I think. But, but uh, the relational theory has been invented by a mathematician. And a mathematician doesn't care about the cost of storage. Uh, code has built the relational theory for the future without thinking about the current limitation. So it was not driven with this obsession of... Um, of storage. The real reasons for normalization are described by code, uh, so I've put a few links there, but I've taken the most important ones. The most important is data integrity. We don't want to duplicate data, it's not because of the cost of storage, because if you start to duplicate data, you have two places where you can update them and forget to update it, or update it, but not being consistent in the immediate seconds with it. So the, the most important is about data and integrity. To avoid problems when inserting, updating data, you must have only one place to do it, and that's the, the, the normal um, uh, data model, the, the normalized data model, where you have only one place, no redundancy. Also, the second point is agility, because uh, normalization is a structure where you can add new information, like new columns and tables, without breaking the whole model and the whole structure. So, agility. And that's funny, because the MongoDB NoSQL databases came also with the idea that they are more agile, but the the relational model was there for agility. Also, one reason, be informative to user. Because when you normalize, and I will explain quickly how we normalize, but when you normalize, you map your structures to business objects. So what the users know. So you are more informative if you just show simple tables rather than a large structure of XML, of JSON, of hierarchical, anything. And also for logical, physical independence, which means that uh, you do not change your application if you change something physical to optimize it. And I will explain how, but just to say that normalization is still important today. It has nothing to do with the cost of storage. You need to think about normalization. Now I will try to explain normalization without going through all the normal forms. And the idea is so forget about the normal forms and just think about the business concept that can be queried or modified, updated independently. The idea of normalization is to separate two concepts that are different, may be used together. We will see that we can join tables, but uh, can be also used alone. And then you, you don't want to put them together. And I will explain what I mean by in your system. You take the business concept, and business concepts can, can be in the domain, like orders, like customers, but in your system, maybe you can query them together or not together. Think about your, the system you are building. And then you group, so you separate the, the different business concepts, but you group what is linked together. If not, you will normalize too much, having only uh, separating each column into, into each uh, table. And I will take an example to, to explain the in your system. Let's, let, let's try to, model, uh, to, to do a data model uh, for addresses. So addresses is in most countries, you have address, zip code, city, country. Are those different business concepts? or are they the same? This depends on your system. For example, if you are just, I think I've taken an example, you have a social media application. 
don't really care about the address of the people. Maybe for legal reason, you ask them when they uh, sign in, uh, but you don't really care. So you can put that in a text somewhere. It will not be updated later in different places. However, the same business concept address, if you build an application for the post office, those will probably be different business concepts. So this is what you have to think about it. The life cycle of those objects in your application, is it just one information that you put or something more complex that can have the uh, multiple modifications? And something I have not put in the slides, but maybe even more important, with the address, what, so let's say you, you, you have your data model, you have addresses for your customers. What happens if the name of a country changes? This can happen in the world. If you want this to be reflected for all your customers, then you need to have the country business concept. And then you update it in one place, and it's changed for everyone. However, if your goal was just to get the address of the people at the time where they signed to your service, probably you want to keep what they have put, even if the name has changed later. So you think about how it will be changed. In one case, it's just an information that was put at the beginning and never updated. In the other case, it's really different concepts that are linked together to build an address, but a country is a country by itself, even if there is no post office, even if there, there, there are no uh, cities in it, a country is a, is, a, is a country. Okay, do not hesitate to interrupt me if you have uh, uh, questions. We will see also an example. Uh, so that's normalization, and then when do you need to denormalize, so have some redundancy, put two, two things that are, should be two different tables, put them together. Um, even if it's bad from modeling point of view, if you quickly build a microservice where you have only one use case, you have one access pattern, Typically, what happens with the NoSQL databases, with document databases, there you can avoid joins by putting everything in a hierarchical structure. Today will be uh, JSON, for example. So it's valid. It's not a bad decision. If you know what you do and you know that your microservice will, have only, will be optimized only for one access pattern. And that may be okay, because today there are many applications that we do not build, like in the past, where applications were built for the next 10 or 20 years. Today, you will have a startup, they will build a microservice, and then when something will change, rather than updating the structure, they will build a new service. So that can be okay. And if you have the impression that joints don't scale, why I am saying the impression, because uh, Joints are quite efficient in all databases, and that's the case in, in Postgres. If you have a good data model, joints can be efficient. So do not go to denormalize just because, oh, I see join between a free table, it will be faster if I do not join. No, you must have a good reason for that. And then you pre-join the result so that uh, you store it as you will query it but then you will not have the agility of normalization. If you update it, you will update a full document, for example. And it's not about using uh, more cheap storage, because if you look at it, when you normalize, you will have more indexes and you will probably use more storage for that. Okay, and I will take an example uh, which comes from a discussion I, I got with a user, the kind of modern application uh, where when you look at the people interested, especially in Ugabyte in the distributed, uh, because it is distributed, people want to scale. And uh, it seems that everyone wants to at some point to build a messenger like Facebook or, or WhatsApp or anything. And was this was his idea, and, and really this user asked this, had this question. 
he was coming from NoSQL, so he was thinking, should I go in a document model or should I go to normalize? So first, let's look at the business concepts and uh, what the user wants to do. So build a messenger where user, so you store user messages and you have additional informations, the content, the text, a timestamp, and the user, of course, and a list of tags and a list of groups ID. Think of groups like uh, family group, friends, or something like that, uh, and a list of tags. And if, if you think about that, that looks quite simple from a developer point of view, but if you think about that, how do you model that? Is, do, do you want a table with tags and a table that will associate tags with messages? Or do you just want to put the list of tags with each message? Th this is uh, uh, actually the, the where you need to decide about it. So first, look at the access patterns. And this is also something that has changed in data modeling from the beginning. When I learned data modeling, we were thinking about the model, uh, a static model. Look at the data and build the logical model on, on this data, and then we put the use cases. And the relational model has the agility to put multiple uh, use cases and to, to optimize for multiple use cases. But today, you need to think directly about what you will do on your data to go faster to, and to have so something that will be um, op optimized for it. So the access pattern here are quite simple. A new message is just putting a, a new post in the database, and I, I use the same terms uh, as a user, put. It's an insert, but for people coming from NoSQL, they say put. So one use case is put the message in the database with all information related. The other is to get the post by tag, ordered by last timestamp, and the post by group, ordered by last, uh, last timestamp. So something quite uh, simple. And, and then let's build that. So I start by identifying the primary keys before identifying the tables. I have users, so I will have a user ID. I have tags, tag ID, group ID, and uh, post ID. And here, we will not focus, uh, for example, for group and post, uh, for group and tag and user. I will use only the ID. Of course, you will have a table that associates an ID with name and many things. But this, in a microservice, may even not be in the database because it's more static and it can be cached. So I will not detail the reference table there, user tags groups. But remember, you have the IDs of them. So first use case, to record a new message, and a new post, you need a table to put them. Uh, sorry, the laser is uh, So the post identified with a post ID will associate this identifier with a user ID, the content, the text, and a timestamp. And then you need a list of tags that you put in another table. Whoops. With tag ID, post ID to do the association. This tag is in this and this and this post, or this post has this and this uh, tags. And the same with groups, exactly the same. OK, so we have this idea. We know uh, what structure we want. And this is the kind of structure we will have in Postgres for that. I don't know if it's very clear. What I want to show is that you have indexes and, and, uh, and uh, tables. In Postgres, every table is a heap table. And even the primary key is like a secondary index. And that's also a point I will make uh, several times here. You need to understand how it is stored. Because it's easy to see a join between two tables in the execution plan, for example. But it's not as easy 
to see the join between the index and the table, which is actually the same, but not so obvious. So here, to record a post, it goes to a post table. I have an index on it, and I have a list of post tags linked to the post, and I have an index on it. So my use case, get post by tag. The use case insert is quite easy. You know where to insert. How to get post by tags. And again, so you want to associate a tag ID to get from, from a tag ID. You want to go um, to the post tag ID table. You have a tag ID. You want to know the post. Then you want to go to the table. You go through the index. The index identifies a row in the post tag. And then you have the post tag ID. And then with this ID in the post tag, you, have, you, you can go to the post. And that's already a, a, like a join. Huh? In the index, you look for the tag ID. This gives you the address of the row in the table. So one op from the index to the table. And then with that, you will get the post ID. And then you have one op to the index. You cannot go directly to the table with that. You go to the index and then to the table. So that's my way in this normalized model in Postgres with heap tables. I know only two databases with heap tables, uh, Oracle and Postgres. A lot of other databases store directly the table in the index. Here, we have those different ops. And this is where some developers started to say, well, uh, joints are expensive. Look at all those different reads that are happening behind a simple use case like that. And to compare it, I will compare it with a database that stores the table in the index, like Yugabyte, because it is distributed. It's not easy to distribute heap tables and B-trees because uh, you need to distribute blocks when you need to distribute only rows, uh, the structure where the table is stored in the primary key, same in MySQL, same in SQL Server by default, for example. So if we add that, so only two tables, which are the primary key indexes, get post by tag, is from the tag ID getting directly the post ID, because we have this table that is ordered in the tag ID, so I can directly access to the tag ID and get the post ID and then go to the table. So I was showing that just to tell you that at some point, to take a decision on data modeling, you need to understand how your database works physically, which again is completely different from the original idea of building a logical data model and then the implementation for a specific database. OK, but there are other possibilities. Because when you see that, from a developer point of view, you are like, oh, wow, in Postgres, it takes three ops, so it's longer. Yeah, but in Postgres, you have also a lot of different ways to structure all that. And this is where we can see some denormalization. And here, the idea will be, rather than having another table to store the relationship between post and tags, just putting the tag IDs with the post, exactly like we would do in a document database. So idea, less tables. So not going to the fully normalized one, having a hierarchical structure within one table. We can store 
the relationship post ID, tag ID, and uh, post ID group ID with each post. As an array, or we can see, uh, have also a JSON, but why not as an array? And this is okay only if you can look up by the ID. Because it's easy to insert it, but remember, we need to find all the posts for an ID. So we need to index something that is within the array. And of course, we, it, it's a possibility. So that's the idea, only one only one table and uh, an index to go directly to the post where one tag is in is associated with the post. But the association is not an association table, the association is uh, within the table itself. So let's see how it is, how you define the table. So same as before, except that I have a list of group IDs. An int is probably not the best, but fits in the slide. And then you need to index that, and this is where you have inverted indexes. Just, you probably already know what are inverted uh, indexes. Uh, they are the same indexes that you find at the end of a book. At the end of a book, you have an index, where for one word, you can go to multiple pages because one word can be in different pages. That's an inverted index. The normal indexes are not like indexes in the book. A normal index for one value, you have one uh, row. So gene indexes on this so that each item of the array has an index entry for group IDs and for uh, tag IDs. So this is another way and, and so this is yeah, uh, another way and, and, and uh, if I can go back, yeah. And you can see that with this one, yeah. You can see that this, uh, with this one, the multiple ops, you have solved them because you can go directly to, to it. Here, you really design for one access pattern. And of course, you may have multiple access patterns, and you have to think about them. You can have other, other indexes on it. But you need to understand the main critical access pattern for that. You can also do that with JSON. So for which reason JSON or IRA? Uh, maybe just to look more modern. If you talk with developers who are fan of MongoDB, they will prefer to store something in JSON. And JSON is also optimized because with JSON B you can have uh, an efficient JSON. It's not just a text in the in the table, and of course you can also index the attributes. So exactly the same idea. And in this slide, I want to explain that we ha we have seen the difference between two databases, but finally, it's not really different. And what I want to 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 push here is that you should think about indexes and tables in the same way. So let me explain. In the, in the case of Yugabyte or any database that stores the table in the primary key, so clustered and ordered, uh, I can also build a gene index. It will reference the row by the primary key. That's the difference. In Postgres heap tables, you reference row with a tuple ID, so physical location of it. With a database that stores in the primary key, you reference a primary key. So finally, the gene index that associates a value with a primary key is very similar to an association table. You think you denormalize, but you are, are just storing in the different way the association table that, uh, that you have for a many-to-many -many relationship uh, association. It's the same if you think about tables and indexes 
the same. And when it is stored in Postgres, in B-trees, here the gene index will directly reference the row, which is of course faster because you have faster access by uh, tuple ID. So what I want to say here is that in any database, you have ways to get fast access if you do not ignore the different possibilities of indexing and the different possibilities of data modeling. And with Postgres, we have mostly everything uh, because of the extensibility. I think the number of kind of indexes, uh, index types are, is, you don't find databases with so much possibilities. Uh, is that faster than an association table? You need to think about how it is stored, but also how it is accessed. And then you look at the execution plan. I will not go into the detail there because the ops between the index and the table that we have seen that look uh, not optimal, there are many optimization on them you can have an index only access, and then you don't have to go to the table. You can have bitmap scan, you still go to the table, but uh, by batch of rows. So everything is optimized. So think about the access pattern, think about the different possibilities of uh, designing this as truly relational or uh, using other techniques, and think about the access in your database looking at an execution plan. So the most important point here to remember, let me put all of them and explain. You have the choice. It's not be pure relational, be pure uh, document model. You have the choice and you can think about it and all those are valid. Nothing is bad here. Think about data integrity. It's probably the most important in a OLTP database. Data warehouse, you do not update individual values, so you don't really care. But data integrity is the, is, is the main driver here. In my example, that was quite easy because I do not update uh, a, a tag. I can add tag, but I will not update, change a tag ID for another. So you, you need to think about all that. Understand the access patterns. And this is discussing with the users, with the developers uh, 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 or, or the business. Understand how it will be accessed. Do not draw a data model just because you find it nice. Uh, you will have application that may have to scale later. By scaling, you, you may design a service that is used by a few users and then it becomes popular and, and then it's used a lot. And this is why the NoSQL database started also. Like, we, start, we have a new startup, we don't have a lot of users, but if we are when they like Amazon, Google, anything, does it scale? You can think about it uh, in this way. And tables and indexes are quite the same physically. So even if it's obvious that you do a nested loop between two tables, it's not so obvious, but you can do have the same happening between an index and the table. And it's not good or bad, you just need to understand it. Okay, do you have questions about it? It's a bit theoretical. I will show you in a demo something else and maybe more uh, you will have questions there uh, something else coming from the same use case with this uh, user where finally one idea was to do something a bit hybrid between those two but we will see that in a demo because I took a shortcut to explain those, but there were an interesting thing in the access pattern. Get the post by tag, ordered by last timestamp. When I add my gene index, I can index on the tag, but then I want to put the timestamp in it to get it ordered on the timestamp so that I can read quickly the last ones. 
That's something you can do in Postgres with an extension. By default, you cannot mix the inverted index on the tag ID and that uh, uh, timestamp. You can do that with uh, 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 the gene B3 or B3 gene extension. I don't remember the name, but that's a possibility. And I will show you here another possibility because finally, indexes are like tables, just they are maintained automatically by the database. If you have a case that is too complex for the right index, you can also build your own table that will be used as an index and you will maintain it with a trigger. So it will still be automatic, you, you will have uh, some codes, but that's the idea. This is a reference to a, a blog post I've written about that, but we'll do that here quickly. Uh, if I can put... Yeah. And if this works, I can paste my create table. So let me paste this create table and explain it. I will... Uh, move the line. The idea here is to create the table as I mentioned before with an array of group IDs, tag IDs, the content. So my single table model, my single table design for the post with a, a, a list of one. But instead of creating, uh, creating a gene index on them, I will create other tables. First, let's put some data there. I quickly generate a few rows. So this is the structure of this table. So. I explain, let me move that. I explain the query, where was the query? I will put it. So select for some tags. Uh, where is the query? Select for some tags, uh, where create date more than I have no indexes for the moment, so this is a sequential scan. This is probably not what I want because in my single table design, I have all documents, I need to read all of them. So this is where you have the choice to look at the uh, gene index with the extension to add the timestamp, or I will create an association table, post by tags, so let me create it and explain where I will have the tag and the reference of the post. Yeah, something I, I should have mentioned, which may look strange. When I defined the post, look at my primary key. I started to do something not, not really relational there because the key of my post, the business key of my post is user post ID. Here, I define it as unique because I want this constraint to be enforced, but I define the primary key as user ID create date post ID to add the create date to it. Why? To be able to filter on the date, the most recent ones, without going to the table when I have a foreign key on it. And this is what we see in this table. So the idea is that you can put more things in the primary key, still enforce the real key, but you can put more things just because you want them in the foreign key. So my table here, post by tags, references the posts with all those columns. So having the created date there in the primary key means that this one is duplicated 
in the table and in the, in the child table. It's kind of denormalization, but automatically maintained because it's the same key. And I do that just because now in this table, I have the creation date. And then I can filter on it to get the last post in, for the last day, for example, without going to the table. And you may find this a bad idea. I'm not saying it's good or bad. There is the theory, and then you need something that works, that is maintainable, and that is optimized. And in my opinion, this works given the user input about the different access patterns. I do the same with groups, exactly the same uh, idea. And then, so this table is empty. I want to maintain it automatically because it's not an index that is maintained automatically. So I, I will create a trigger for that. And to go faster, I will create it and zoom on it to show quickly the code, but there is nothing really strange. You can do a lot with very simple. So you have to code it, but it's kind of declarative coding. And the thing I will do with a trigger is that uh, when there is an, any update on a post, I will just remove the tags related to it and add it again in the table. So you see a delay, delete, insert the new ones, same for groups. I do uh, both of them. In the slide, there is the reference to the blog post about it. And again, some people will say, oh, I don't like triggers. I don't like uh, uh, start procedures. Yeah, you can like or not, but think about something that works. It's easier to maintain that in the database than with the application. So then I create the trigger. You can do better. I do something very simple for any modification, insert, update, delete. I remove all tags. I add more ta uh, all tags. Is it good or bad? That's fine if I know that I usually do not update a lot of uh, posts. It's rare that you go to a post and remove a tag, for example. So. For the moment, my tables are empty. So when you manage it yourself without an index, you have two things to do. First, the code to maintain it, and also to initially, uh, initialize it if you do it uh, when there is data in the table. So for that, I just run inserts. So using functions that unnest the array, so putting the array to relational rows, and inserting them. I'm doing that just to show that it's not so difficult, even for a developer who do not know well uh, SQL. It's not so difficult, and it's something that you don't have to maintain, because you will change it only when you add a new colon, maybe. And it's something that you test once. When you do something like that in the database, you test it with unit test, and then you know that it will work if you have the right isolation level. You know that it will work even uh, on race condition with multiple users. This one, probably, you need to run it in serializable, but I, I will not go into the uh, details uh, there. So my table looks like that for a group. I identify the post with user ID, post ID, and I have the date. So there, I have everything I need to filter, which is the goal of an index, usually. You put everything you want to filter before going to the table. Here, I do that directly with a table that I maintain with a, with a trigger. And if I look at the execution plan, I can see that, finally, I have a nested loop between this table, so the, here I query on, uh, on tag, I go directly. Here I am on Yugabyte. Also, I do that because the plan is simple, because uh, the tables are stored in the primary key, so it's just one join between uh, the, the two primary keys. 
with Postgres that works also, you will uh, see a bitmap scan. So you have the choices and you can also be creative with some code. Even if it's not really declarative code like creating an index, where you just say create index and everything is done for you, it's, oh, sorry, you don't see the slides? There. It's not too difficult to maintain or to explain to a developer, even if the developer doesn't really know SQL, he knows Java. Uh, you explain what does a nest, what is an array, uh, and what is a trigger, and then uh, uh, it's nearly OK. Huh? OK, so this is mostly what I wanted to show, that you have the choice. I know some DBAs you will, who will tell, uh, no, the SQL theory, you need to follow, you need to normalize, there are many reasons for that, just do it. My fear, and, and I like that, I like the normal forms, I, I like all this theory, like I like maths, but my fear is that if you annoy your developers with all this theory, they will just go out of SQL and go to no SQL databases. So even if I'm not 100% happy with this kind of design, this is much better for the application uh, than going to a database where you have no consistency, where you cannot change uh, the structure easily. So you need to balance between the theory and what works. And this is only f related to your application. Of course, if you design the next uh, ERP in your enterprise that will uh, be there for the next 20 years, you will probably need a data model more normalized than just building a new microservice for an application that will be there for the next two years. Do you have any Questions, if we have time, maybe we have three minutes or something like that. So the first one was the microphone. Hi. Uh, one of the mo uh, major problem for me to use data like JSON or data like arrays is just arrays exist in PostgreSQL for more than 10 years now. But JPA and Hibernate simply do not understand that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so th there's a form to, to... Yeah, but with my trigger, for example, I make it transparent for the query. I can make it also transparent for... You, this is where you can use stored procedures. With GPA, with Hibernate, you cannot map all those things, but you can map the call to stored procedures. Of course, you need to discuss with the architect and convince him that stored procedure is not so bad as he thinks. But uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a, a problem with mapping, but you do not need to, to do that. With a view, for example, in my example, I queried by, with the join, but I can provide a, a view that will do the same. Another question? Yeah, ask in Portuguese also. Uh, so someone will uh, will translate it for. <laughs> certo, gente. É, boa tarde. É, eu trabalho com uma operação de migrações de dados, né, de ETL. E aí eu achei bem interessante usar o array ali para. Ah, sorry. Oh, I, I thought someone would uh, <laughs> would translate, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think you can. Beleza. É, eu trabalho com operação de ETL, né, migrações de dados, e eu gostaria de saber é, se essa aplicação do array, da lista ali dentro de um, de um determinado campo, é, funcionaria muito bem com index ou com, com IDs de um sistema legado, onde eu não estou armazenando ele diretamente em uma outra tabela, mas sim de uma tabela de um banco que não está armazenado na mesma estrutura. Não sei se ficou claro. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the translator told me, I don't know if that's clear enough. Yeah, uh, I, I think I didn't understand the question, but we can discuss later if you want, I'm sorry. Or, or if someone has an idea, maybe. Or, or not. But I, I, what I understood is that it's also about the mapping, using, using that with, uh, yeah, not with JPA, but, but with something else. But in a relational database, you can put everything behind views and stored procedures, and then you provide services to, to the application. Maybe that's the solution. OK, any other question? We will not do it again with the translation because that's too, <laughs> that's too difficult for. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Perfect. So if you have no more questions, anyway, I'm at the conference and I will be happy to discuss everything. If you want to know more about your GABA, it was not the point of this uh, or this, but I will be happy to, to talk about it. It's just compatible with Postgres. So everything we have seen there works the same for the API. The, of course, the storage is distributed, so the performance, all that, you need to think about it. But that's also the case. You, you will not have the same performance also if you query on different uh, kind of platforms. So, so you need to think about how it is stored. Like accessing via index, we also depend on the amount of memory that you have, the, 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 the storage that you have, all that. OK, thank you very much. <laughs>